this is a, a serious problem of biotic homogenization. Uh, this is another example, another look at this uh, at this problem. Uh, this map shows uh, percent of the state's current fish fauna that is composed of introduced species, and the darker colors uh, represent 50% or more. So 50% or more of these uh, state's fish uh, diversity is represented by introduced species. So again, a great deal of, of uh, mixing the species, especially in the, in the Western uh, United States. Why is this important? Well, this is important because in, in some cases, introduced species uh, generate local uh, species extinction. So these uh, two graphs show you number of states and then number of species. And here we have number of locally extinct species by state and then number of introductions. So we have um, a, a small number, uh, maybe a few states over here and over here, a small number of states that have had a great deal of introductions, species introductions, uh, over here and species extirpations over here. And we see that the two patterns, the two uh, trends um, are um, kind of com comparable, right? So we have a lot of states with uh, extirpation and then most of the states with uh, no extirpations or no uh, uh, locally extinct, uh, local extinctions. And then we have uh, a number of states with high introductions and then those kind of uh, tapering off. But again, in a nutshell, what this is trying to say is, one, we are, by moving species around, we are, we are homogenizing, making uh, systems more similar than historically, historically used to be, and two, these introductions can uh, generate uh, local extinctions and if endemic species, then we are actually generating a, a full extinction of that, of that species. Any questions so far? Um, the same, the same, uh, actually a different study did uh, a similar, uh, had a similar approach of comparing uh, fish diversity, but at this time globally. And what they did, the, the researchers did in this paper that was published more recently in 2011, was to compare basins across the world by, uh, by biogeographic region. So what we have here, for example, for the Nearctic and Afrotropical uh, uh, biogeography regions, biogeographic regions, we have number of non-native species in basins, in all basins in Nearctic and Afrotropical regions, and then percent of basins that have that uh, have those uh, non-native or introduced species. So we see that in the Nearctic region, we have. Um, an increasing, so this is no uh, invasive, spe no introduced species, and this is up to 20 introduced species. So as we see the bars getting higher in this area, it means that there are a lot of basins, percent-wise, a lot of basins that have uh, many species introduced. Um, so if we compare the Nearctic with the Afrotropical region, what we see is that um, about 60% of the, of the uh, basins have not had any uh, introductions, which is good news. Uh, but then we have a few, um, a few basins uh, that have 6 to 10 uh, and 11 to 20 introductions um, uh, happening. And the same thing was, the same type of analysis was done for the Australian and Palearctic region. Uh, what we see are uh, in the Palearctic uh, region, uh, a more even distribution, meaning that we've moved uh, species around probably more so. We have more time uh, in the Palearctic region um, as humans. Okay. So this uh, this is one, like I said, one uh, problem to consider: this biotic homogenization and uh, potentially uh, local extirpation, local extinction of species. Um, other reasons we should care about invasive species is that. Some invasive species may affect the um, nutrient cycling or nutrient dynamics. Um, some species may affect the fire frequency. This is important, uh, at least in the United States, uh, with the introduction of, for example, um, cedar, um, which I don't know, uh, it's... Junipers. Junipers, um, it's genus. But int introduction of some species has, uh, has changed the fire regime. For example, um, 
making the landscape more closed and um, with either with build up of that material generating uh, stronger fires or completely changing, uh, slowing down the fire uh, frequency. And then uh, some, some invasive introduced species also introduce uh, diseases, uh, pathogens. Um, then we, we have, uh, it's hard to figure out with introduction of species how species interactions will change, but obviously these uh, introductions, these species do not um, act in a vacuum, they interact with species and um, they, they change the, um, uh, the interactions that originally or naturally occurred in a system. And then this is again important, uh, we may see uh, native taxa going extinct because of competition, introduction of a pathogen, uh, various reasons. Okay, so what do we do? Let's say we, um, we discover that sadly uh, a protected area that we care about, the reserve, has an introduced species or has several uh, species that have been accidentally uh, introduced with transport of goods or humans or whatnot. Uh, first thing to know is that um, it is very difficult and it takes a lot of money to actually get rid of a species if it's well established. Um, and also controlling for an invasive species is quite, uh, quite uh, difficult. So eradication and control we, we think about those once the species is established and those are hard, those are uh, difficult management situations to be in. Uh, of course, the best approach is preventive. All the always uh, preventing something is better than treating something. So the best approach uh, with invasive species management is try to prevent, prevent introduction. How do we do that? Generally, what we do is if we know that a species uh, that an introduction, uh, um, an introduced species has become, has established in a region that is uh, neighboring our area of interest, we definitely need to establish uh, a monitoring uh, program and early detection program. So basically have surveys so that we detect the first, the few individuals uh, at the onset of the introduction and we, uh, we eliminate those. We don't allow for the uh, uh, non-native species to establish. Uh, we also can do risk analysis, and this goes back to models. So <laughs> again, we rely on ecological niche modeling. Um, we generate predictions of potential distributions of these species uh, based on their native uh, range, based, based on occurrences we have from the native range and environmental data we have from the native range. We can predict the potential distribution of the species. We can estimate that just like we did with uh, cli the climate change examples, we estimate the potential distribution of the species in a new region, and that becomes one map that we can use, one type of information we can use in a risk analysis uh, for a region of interest. So that gives us uh, additional information. There's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of talk about ecological niche modeling for invasive species. There are many different uh, issues and, and angles to consider. I can, you know, we can, have a discussion about that if you are if you are interested, and then uh, we should have some policies to reduce the, this uh, propagule pressure. By propagule pressure, we mean the those individuals, those few individuals that manage to uh, disperse into a new region. So, if we have um, this propagule pressure, um, if we have a high propagule pressure, meaning this happens occurs. Uh, repeatedly, um, individuals make it to a new region, then um, that has that gives more chance to that species to get established. So the more propagules we have, the more likely for a species to become, a non-native species to become established. So that's when we need these policies to reduce the number of propagules that make it, uh, the number of individuals that make it to a new region. And how we do that, um, for example, in the United States, um, the um, shipments are randomly controlled. New shipments, new uh, shipments of, for example, timber or um, some um, seedlings of plants, of um, ornamental plants. This is done at the broadest level, at the federal level, let's say. And it is not, it's not as effective as we would think so because, well, it's not as effective because we have such a, 
uh, uh, such a, an intense or such a large amount of goods that are uh, that are moved um, daily uh, in United well anywhere in the world. So uh, at the more regional level, what can be done with this is um, checkpoints. So checkpoints, we can go to the finest level at the entrance in uh, in a protected area. You can have a checkpoint uh, and a policy to uh, make sure that whatever good is. Uh, uh, transiting the area is not affected by a certain invasive species that we know is present outside of the uh, uh, park or outside of the protected area. So if we have an insect that we know is, is a serious pest to um, native tree species and we have uh, movement or trans uh, transiting of um, um, wood shipment, we should be checking uh, that wood to make sure it doesn't carry those insects that that, that pest that is that could affect the uh, health of the trees in or the forest in that region. So, various ways to uh, try to reduce uh, propagule pressure for aquatic species. Species it means you have to uh, clean the boat to make sure that you are not moving one uh, species from one lake and in, uh, generally invertebrates from one lake to another. Anyways, any questions up until this point? Um, yes, Bilal. How do you how do you know when and uh, hold on? How do you know when a species problem might come up with so so you could have the presence of a non native species, mm -hmm. but it may not be problematic mm -hmm. with a lower density. Mm -hmm. And so you know, for park managers who are faced with all these limitations, how do you, what resources do you dedicate at what time to try and make yeah. sure that it doesn't spread, but you also don't want to, like, where is the, where is Separation the... Separation between yeah. the many possible limitations and the ones that actually matter. Yeah. Well, that's that's uh, difficult to decide, to figure out, at least initially, if we don't have information about the species uh, potential to become established and invade uh, fast. So there, there are lists of high risk uh, species and usually managers um, monitor for those, you know, worst uh, 10 uh, invasive species that are present in the general region. And it's a completely new species that nobody knows anything about that we won't know, we, we, the managers will not, will not spend time on that because they don't know it may not. It, it may never become a problem. Um, we can we can use information about the bio, biology of a species if we have that kind of information. So if we know, if we know it reproduces fast, it, uh, it's a generalist, it establishes fast, then we are more likely to be aware, afraid of that uh, species and, and uh, start some form of, of preventive uh, uh, policy. Yeah, but it's. With so many species that are being move or moved around, it's really hard to uh, to prioritize. It's always about priorities. It's hard to prioritize without any prior uh, information. So we make the best we can with the information we have uh, we have available. Okay. Uh, so I think we talked about this. Now the second so um, eradication uh, is the uh, last resort. <laughs> because um, it's re rarely we are successful in completely eradicating, uh, removing uh, the, uh, that introduced species. So the classic examples where, uh, where eradication works is uh, from islands. If we have islands and we have goat pigs, rats, well, I don't know about rats. Rats are hard to uh, eradicate. Unless you introduce a disease and they, naturally, they die because of the disease you introduced, it's actually quite hard to get uh, rid of rat, uh, get rid of rats. You can have a very bad idea of introducing maybe cats or mongoose to take care of the rats, and that would be really a disaster. But uh, usually, goats and pigs we can get rid of them because people like to eat goats and pigs. So uh, we just you know open season hunting, and um, and that's that is doable. Yet it's not it's not easy to do, and it's not. Uh, cheap to do. However, we can get rid of goats and pigs more readily, more easily than getting rid of an in, uh, insect, a pest, uh, getting rid of, I don't know, a snake or um, 
I'm sorry? Well, they are um, introduced uh, artificially on islands and then they become uh, feral and they just munch down the vegetation. It has happened uh, in the past and it's not a good uh, situation. Same with pigs, feral pigs. We are talking about feral pigs, for example, in Hawaii. Complete, complete, uh, not